Uh, um, as I think the program, we have quite a very talented group of individuals who are extraordinarily knowledgeable. Uh, we have James Crin from DSS, who you know has been doing this for quite a number of years. Um, we also have uh, Bob Litt, who used to be the general counsel at the uh, DNI, and I worked with him when he was at Department of Justice and is now um, returned to private practice and is with uh, Morrison and Forster. Uh, we also have um, Alan Sonsby, who's with us. Uh, Alan uh, joins us from uh, academia, uh, where he's at Penn State and runs the Applied Research Lab. And we also have um, Leslie Lettuce, who's from um, Raytheon Company, and is the director of R&D and does the intelligence information and services. So we have quite an array of the different bases covered. And I'm going to just, I think most of the people in the room, I know many of you, but I would say we've reached a point with a number of reports that have come out, the DUIX report, the general accounting report, that have focused on the concept of what many of us in this panel have been dealing with for quite literally the last 20 years, is the mechanism by which we are able actually to protect the defense industrial base, intellectual property, and it's also the subsidy issue of the insider threat problem, which goes in tandem, because we always say there's at least four <laughs> vulnerabilities that we have. We have software vulnerabilities, we have hardware vulnerabilities, we have carbon units, you know them as people, and we also have uh, the ISPs in which everything runs. Uh, but I think there's been increased focus, both in the private sector and the government, on trying to understand how a report that I was involved in that we came out with recently, Deliver on Compromise by uh, the MITRE Corporation, trying to focus on what the appropriate relationship should be between DOD and the private sector. So with that, I'd like to get right into the panel. James, why don't you sort of set the table for us and give us a sense of where DSS is today. Okay. Well, you should go. go. All right. I think you're right. All right. Am I live? Okay, good. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'll use my time this morning on the panel to really kind of outline three areas. One, uh, give you a government perspective, a DSS perspective, defense security service perspective on the threat landscape. Secondly, I want to talk a little bit about what are the technologies that are most targeted by our adversaries. And third, how do we as the Department of Defense, Defense Security Service do outreach, but also what's our response to that threat landscape? So the first thing, a few words about Defense Security Service for those who might not be familiar with us. We are a DOD agency. We fall under the authority direction of the USDI, Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence. Our primary mission today, although we're getting um, uh, mission expansion, is ongoing right now. But principal mission is the critical technology protection mission, which we execute on behalf of the Secretary of Defense, who is the executive agent for the National Industrial Security Program. So essentially, we're providing CI, counterintelligence and security services, across industry. Roughly 10,000 cleared companies, roughly 12,500 cleared facilities. So that's our interaction. We've got 46 locations around the United States. But back to the threat picture. So I think uh, the way we framed up this panel, we talked about the link between economic security and national security. And I think it's fair to say that you can no longer talk about national security without addressing economic security. And the national security strategy that came out in December of last year really does reinforce this point that economic security is fundamental. So from an intelligence services of, of our adversaries, they are looking at three things. Uh, primarily, uh, industry is the prime target. And by that, they're looking at the information that uh, industry and academia possess that help them advance their military forces. It also looks at the information that they can use and steal from technology-wise to advance their technological capabilities by generations. And the third thing that, that we really look at is it's the intellectual property that's at risk that often puts the companies in direct competition with those that stole their information. So that's something that we want to uh, reinforce as our panel goes through this today so that economic impact is loss of jobs, loss of financial uh, ability of those companies that are being targeted. From a counterintelligence perspective, uh, we've been stating this over the last couple of years, we really believe, and it's our assessment, that the United States is now facing the most uh, 
the, the threat we face from foreign intelligence is unprecedented in our history. By that, again, I go back to industry is the prime target. And what we try to reinforce is the defense industrial base operates every day in a contested environment. And there are three things I'd ask you to consider. One is the cyber operations, cyber breaches, cyber penetrations that are ongoing. And, you can, and you, I think you know if you've read any of the, uh, the news reports that pick up these stories that there are significant operations underway against both industry and government infrastructure. The globalization of business, the, th the tools and the processes used in business and globalized environment are, are used by the adversary. And the third thing is the global workforce, our need to optimize and leverage and capitalize on the skill sets across the globe from academic, from research, uh, that also presents a challenge for us in terms of the importance of insider threat pro programs over time. The globalization of business, foreign direct investment, things like the CFIUS reform that was signed in as part of the National Defense Authorization Act. We also base our assessment on the reporting that we get from industry. Last year alone, we received over 56,000 reports of suspicious activity from cleared industry. That allowed us then to turn it, in, that information into many thousands of intelligence reports that went across uh, U.S. government, intelligence community. And the third thing is we had several hundred leads that went over to law enforcement, so we can actually strike back at the adversary from a CI perspective, from a law enforcement perspective, but also from an intelligence perspective. And one last thing on the threat. If you go back to 21 June, there was a, a hearing in front of the House Armed Services Committee. I really uh, refer you back to that briefing, and you can download the, the DOD joint testimony before that committee. And it really does a great job of outlining China's threat and approaches, and I refer you to that. And I also refer you to the video of that as well. So what are the specific technologies that are most targeted? And I'm really avoiding the word here, vulnerability, that, that are most vulnerable. These are the ones that are most targeted. Again, this information comes out of the reporting that we receive from industry. So every year we publish a trends report that, that gives you the understanding of what the adversary is targeting, what specific technology and what specific methods of operation. So the top five technologies based on last year's reporting are aeronautics, command control communications and computers, C4, electronics, and you can read microelectronics in that, radar systems, and then finally armaments and survivability, so armor and missiles. This information is available on dss.mil. It's a good uh, place to refer to some uh, information. That report is unclassified and you can pull it down. At the same time, the top five methods the adversary uses to target that technology are again these business things like attempted acquisition, request for information, solicitation, cyber operations, resume submission for uh, seeking a, uh, a position within that cleared industry partner, and then commercial activity, leveraging those things. So I refer you back to those three things I mentioned earlier, cyber, globalized business, and globalized workforce. They play out again in the same MOs that we're seeing from, from the threat. So how do we do outreach? Uh, first and foremost, I will mention we have uh, the Center for Development for Security Excellence. I refer you to cdse.edu. But also, in addition to that, we have uh, every day, we've got three people who are engaging with the cleared facility facilities across the United States. That is our CI special agent, our industrial security reps, and our information system security professionals. They have an ongoing relationship with industry at each of those locations. We also participate in forums like this at INSA and FCA. We participate in industry forums with NDIA, AIA. We also participate at the very local level with National Classification Management Society, which helps us reach the small and medium firms that are participating uh, in the program. So what's our response? Our response is to move away from a compliance-focused approach to industrial security, to critical tech protect. We are now much more driven by threat, and we are using intelligence and reporting from industry to identify the gaps in security, and we're working with industry to build, to build to tailored security plans. That's the change. We know the top technologies we must protect. We've prioritized those. And we've got now, partnering with industry, a very comprehensive tailored security plan that is the outcome of that partnership. So other outreach we have, we have a counterintelligence partnership program where we bring uh, threat professionals from industry who are cleared that come into our uh, facility and we are able to use their reporting, blend it with all source information, and it helps that company be responsive back to the threat back across their enterprise. We have about 10 to 12 companies participating today. 
On a monthly basis, we have secure video teleconference where we have upwards of 500 participants, both industry and government. It's a significant part of our outreach. And we provide real-time current uh, threat information to industry. Our government partners, other government agencies, also participate in those. And one last thing, uh, Mr. Uh, Rishikoff mentioned deliver on compromise. This is something the department is pursuing. It's an initiative, and we're leveraging the advisory report that came out of MITRE, but essentially it elevates security as the fourth pillar in the acquisition process. It incentivizes industry to deliver capabilities not compromised to our warfighter, and there are a number of things that we're working towards in that plan. There are about 15 recommendations that the department's looking to operationalize. So let me stop there and get that, again, Great. this threat landscape, what are the technologies, and what's our response, and how do we do outreach? Thank you, Jim. And I just have some housekeeping matters I'd like to uh, make sure that we're aware of is that. If anyone has any questions, there's some uh, sheets on your, on your being held up that are on the different sort of seats, and just pass them down to the um, a person on the aisle who's going to come by and pick them up, raise your hand, and we'll integrate them as quickly as we can into the, the panel. I also particularly want to thank uh, Noblis for sponsoring this particular event, and we want to thank them for taking the initiative in this. Also, their CLE credits. Are, do we have any lawyers in the room? How sad. Okay. Uh, they're not <laughs> enough. Uh, so I guess the continuing legal education will not be an issue here. And we also, I see a lot of press and media, so I uh, realize that this is all going to be recorded and open, and I want to make sure he remains promotable in the government position he's in. So um, let's make sure that you ask questions that are to the point and distinct. Uh, with that, uh, why don't we get the perspective from the private sector, but I was wondering how many people in the room represent private sector industries? Raise your hand. So this is what we're looking for. So one of the issues that um, we're going to have uh, Leslie talk about is the perspective of how Raytheon is approaching it, but one of the questions I have for you as a group individually and as a, is how do you make sort of security and moving it from a cost center to a profit center? What would be some of the incentives that you would like to see in industry and what Raytheon would also like to see potentially? Okay. With that, thanks. So thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts here with you today. This is an area that I'm extremely passionate about, so I'll try to keep it kind of low key, but I might get kind of excited and start talking with my hands. My family's Italian, so I gotta, gotta do that. Um, so as James has just described, there are a lot of things um, that are out there that we really need to be worried about. And I'm gonna focus mostly on industries, advanced research and development, since I am the director of research and development. I'm gonna sound like I'm doing a paid advertisement for DSS here in a minute, but um, security is everybody's problem. I mean, I've got 30 years of industry experience, and whenever I started, you had people who developed systems, you had the engineers, and then you had those security guys down the hall, and we weren't quite sure what they did. You know, we developed the functionality of the systems, and then they, you know, sprinkled their magic on it, but we weren't, you know, completely involved. Now I think even researchers and people who are engineers really need to be aware of these threats. So I'm just going to list off four documents that I think are required reading for industry, and in particular people who are doing research. You may not sleep very well at night after you read all of these. But uh, the first one is the MITRE report that Harvey mentioned has some really good things uh, for industry to be looking at, some things that might be coming down the pike as far as different ways that proposals are going to be evaluated. I mean, obviously, industry, we're driven by how proposals are evaluated. So certainly having security as a fourth pillar in addition to cost schedule and performance, you know, gives us the opportunity to really bake that in from the very beginning. And that's really important. Um, another document that, that James mentioned was the yearly report on um, trend analysis and cleared industry. It is available on the DSS website. I downloaded it. Um, there's a lot of good information in there, even at the summary level, um, that as industry, you know, even if you're an engineer or, you know, working on research and development, you really need to be aware of that. Um, the National Counterintelligence and Security Center publishes a yearly report on foreign economic espionage and cyberspace. Again, things that we as engineers, technical researchers, really need to be aware of. And then there's another DSS publication, which was probably my favorite, 
It was the 24-page um, short written kind of like a quick start guide to your you know, software that you get um, called Counterintelligence Best Practices for Cleared Industry. Everybody should read that. It's got some very good examples, some examples of some um, countermeasures, and just provides an awareness of all the stuff that's going out there. Like I said, in the past, engineering and you know the scientific people have been separated a lot from the real details of security, and I don't think we can afford to be separated anymore. So something to think about, and this is kind of what reading all of those documents as well as some other ones made me think about. So in industry, when we look at our customers' problems, you know, we listen to their problems and problem space, and we figure out how to map those real physical problem space problems to technology space, because we're geeky and it's you know, fun to look at things in technology space. But we do that mapping, and then we look and we try to figure out, okay, what technology do we need? How do we get there? What kind of gaps do we have? How do we go about filling those gaps? Do we do internal research? Do we go out and seek to acquire um, technology from other companies or you know, from universities? Do we do directed research with universities? Um, the part of Raytheon that I work in, we do a lot of applied research. We're not so much into the 6.1 fundamental research. So the research that we're doing, um, it can be restricted in some ways. There are some you know, control systems that can be put in place um, for that type of restriction, since, for, excuse me, for that type of research since it is applied research. So while we're doing all of that and figuring out how we're going to solve the customer's problems, our adversaries are doing a very similar exercise. They're looking at things that they wish to accomplish, uh, whether it be getting technologies, you know, similar to ours, coming up with ways that um, they seek to target our technologies, target our systems. They're doing that same exercise. And unfortunately, a lot of the way that they look to fill their gaps, as you'll read in the DSS reports, is economic espionage. Okay. Some of the things that we can do as industry to help, especially when we're working with universities, and as I mentioned, we work more on the applied research, so again, the 6.1 stuff um, that, that you're going to talk about doesn't really factor into here, but you want to go into those agreements, you know, well armed. There are a lot of agreements um, that can be made that make things a little bit easier when you're doing research. Some things, whenever you start to do research, you think, oh my gosh, this is going to take forever to get all the terms and conditions set up, and it's going to take forever to get all the IP worked out, <coughs> and all the control systems, how we're going to protect the technology. But you can do things like master research agreements that let you work with the university over a period of time, and you work out those terms and conditions in advance. And then whenever you want to do certain um, applied research projects, you negotiate the statements of work on those individual projects, but all of the work for the terms and conditions and the protections and other things has already been done up front. And as you can imagine, that takes a great deal of time to work through. Uh, there's some other alternatives that some universities offer, um, things that they call templated research um, agreements. So these are research agreements that are produced in a template form, which obviously, being a template, don't have everything filled out. But the general outline of the agreements are in place. And once that's agreed to by both you know, the university as well as industry, then, believe it or not, it is easier to get those terms and conditions and statements of work for each of the projects, which you'll have to negotiate separately. It's easier to get those in place. Um, something else that's helpful, something that we like doing, is we like working with universities that already have relationships with the DOD and the intelligence community. You know, a lot of times they have um, closed areas set up where classified research can be done. We can work on some cooperative research and development agreements, you know, with our DOD counterparts and that university. That's a really good way to get plugged into that kind of research where you know that, you know, the protections are in place. Um, another thing that can be done, uh, a lot of companies have done it, Raytheon is, has done it um, several times, you can set up a partnership with the university. And this is a partnership where 
you can set up an access control lab on the campus and the professors and the students can work on your research there. So it can be access controlled, uh, leads to really productive partnerships, um, certainly enhances uh, being able to protect the information. Obviously it does require investment from industry, um, but these have worked out really well. So we've talked about setting up that agreement and getting all that first step out of the way, but that's not enough. You know, I mentioned that you really do need to read those four documents. There's more, but those are the four at least that I thought were, were most important. Your industry PIs, you have to equip them for success. They have to be aware of all of these things. You have to give them resources so that they can succeed. You can't just say, go do good stuff and, you know, by the way, keep everything safe. You have to give them the resources that they need. So they need awareness training. They need to read those four documents. Um, they need to have access to subject matter experts from technology, from global trade and compliance. Um, they need, you know, expertise from supply chain management, from contracts. You know, all of these things have to be available to your industry PIs. Um, at Raytheon, we have an industry, uh, or excuse me, a university coordinator that kind of serves as a focal point for the PIs, you know, if they get stuck or there's something that they need to know how to do or they need somebody to talk to, they can always go back to that industry coordinator. That's their kind of lifeline to phone a friend, if you will. Um, so those are some things that I think are really helpful and have been helpful to us. Um, again, with advanced research and development, we focus primarily on the applied research, we also have some ideas for systems, you know, that we might want to develop or capabilities. So let me just talk for just a couple of minutes about developing these capabilities. In the past, as I mentioned, developers and security folks didn't really tightly integrate or collaborate. Again, it was something that as a software developer, developer I used to write code a long time ago, which is pretty cool. Um, as a software developer, I didn't really worry about the security aspects, you know, or vulnerabilities because that was something that those security guys down the hall worked on. They were the ones who were talking to you, reading your documents, not us as engineers. But as I mentioned, that, that's changed. As engineers, we absolutely have to be aware of that. Some things that are coming and are here in industry such as Agile, DevOps, those things that, that have great benefit to produce really short cycle time and getting capability and getting fixes there quickly. Well, those also mean that functional testing and security testing have to be very tightly integrated. And that testing, whenever you've got these short, res uh, short cycles to get new versions of capability out there, that testing needs to be automated and it needs to be thorough. You know, a lot of times when you fix something, you know, I'm speaking again from a software perspective because that's what I have the most experience with. When you fix something, you break something else. So it's not enough just to deliver things quickly. You have to deliver things secure quickly. And so security and cybersecurity isn't something that, you know, you bolt on at the very end of a development. It's something that really has to be baked in. So your cybersecurity specialists, your software engineering specialists, they need to be working together and it all needs to be considered part of a bigger problem. You know, as I mentioned, you know, security is everybody's job. It's just not the job of the security guys down the hall that do who knows what. It's all of our jobs. So we really need to be aware of the threats that are out there. We really need to understand that we need to build resilient systems in these systems, I mean, it's not enough to think we're going to keep everybody out, you know, because that typically is something very hard to achieve, nirvana. And as smart as people are and kind of the arms race of developing capabilities, chances are there is going to be a penetration into the system. So the systems that we design have to be resilient and able to um, still function in the presence of some kind of an intrusion, ideally fighting through that 
potential intrusion or compromise. I mean, it's kind of like, anybody watch that show BattleBots? Okay, it's kind of like BattleBots, but with software, okay? We want the software to be able to keep doing their um, capabilities, keep functioning, be able to deal with attacks, maybe even throw a few attacks of their own, like in the battle bots you see, but it really is everybody's problem. Thanks, thanks, Leslie. Thanks. First of all, I'm just curious, how many people in the room can actually write an algorithm? Raise your hand. <laughs> so these are the more dangerous people that you were focused on. These are the, what we call the geeks. Yes. The rest of you are the wonks, <laughs> and we need the geek wonk bridge in this process. And then, curiously, how many of you own Bitcoin, own some Bitcoin? You know, it's just all the individuals who also seem to be able to write algorithms. So, and how many of you uh, are, you know for a fact that your data at rest is encrypted? And the rest of you are unclear about that? That's not a good thing. That's a takeaway from here. Uh, but now let's also move to the academic side. So, Alan, you, you do the 6.1, which is basic research fund. I don't know if you also do 6.2, 6.3, 6.4, 6.7. .7. Are you all familiar with this? This is the different categories we use about applied research and specific research and basic research. Yeah, first, I'll, I'll give you, but first I want to do a quick okay. survey. We saw how many folks were from industry in the room. How many from academia and universities? Okay, so my community did not let me down here. Uh, I noticed those are the same people that own Bitcoin, which is making me yeah. a bit nervous. <laughs> no, we buy Ethereum, we don't buy Bitcoin. <laughs> So, so we, we talked about R&D, so just so get everybody on the same page, there's three types of research and development for, for budgetary and execution purposes. There's basic research, there's applied research, and there's development. So I'm going to focus just on the basic research side, and if you were in the DOD or using DOD money, this would be the 6-1 or 6-2 dollars, budget activity one or budget act activity two. Uh, First, we talked about some, some must-reads. This came out earlier in the year. This is the 2018 Science and Engineering Indicators. This is the short version. The full version is, is about three inches thick. This is probably the scariest document I have ever read. This shows you and tells you where innovation is occurring and who's doing it. And it's not only us. So take a look at this. You can download it from the National Science Foundation. Uh, they're required to deliver it to Congress every even-numbered year. So because I'm an engineer, we're going to talk some numbers uh, first uh, before we get into the policy side. Uh, right now, the U.S. spends about $496 billion and places us as, as the number one nation in, in spending on research and development. China spends $408 billion on R&D. We're increasing our spending about 4% annually. China is increasing their spending at about 18% annually. So when the 2020 version of this rolls out, we will likely not be the number one uh, spender of research and development. Now, now talking, switching to just the basic research side, the six one, the six two dollars. Uh, in the U.S., we spend about eighty three billion dollars on, on basic research. About half of that is is spent by industry, uh, nonprofits, and, and the federal government at the at the national labs. The other half, about forty three billion dollars, is, is spent by universities. There's a lot of uh, work going on. Now for, I guess for everyone in the room, when a university is doing research, who's actually performing the research? Faculty and? Graduate, graduate students. students, right, graduate students. Graduate students. <laughs> well, we're getting to that. So, so in the U.S., more than 57 percent of the graduate students in engineering are foreign students, international students, over 57 percent. At Penn State, it's about 70% of, of graduate students in engineering that are, are international students. So that, that's who's doing the research. Um, let's talk about national output of this basic research. So professors and graduate students, what do they like to do? Publish. Write, exactly, they publish, they, they write papers. The number one nation in the world for publication of peer-reviewed science papers is? China. China. We're number two. But you, you, can, you, can, you can argue, oh, okay, well, all research and all papers are not created equal. There's a quality level and there's an impact factor. Okay, so let's look at the, the number of papers that are cited or referenced the most by other folks writing papers. 
So that we're still leading. So there's what's called the 1% club. And the number of, of papers that come out of a nation that are in the top 1% of cited papers, US is leading. Guess who's number two? China. And their rate uh, over the past uh, decade, their number of papers uh, uh, that have been coming into the 1% club have been increasing faster than the US. So uh, uh, shortly, we will be number two in that. So, so the takeaway of all that is, is high impact research is occurring across the globe. It's not only in the US. Uh, there's other universities, uh, India, China, they're world-class university. I mentioned the, the, the foreign international students that are doing research in engineering. For the first time in, in recent history, the number of international students studying uh, engineering computer science in the United States has actually decreased. Mm -hmm. So these really, really smart students now have a choice and they're choosing actually some of them not to come to Penn State. So in computer science, they were down by 18% between fall of 16 and fall, fall of 17. Um, in engineering, it was down by 8%. So that's, I'm not sure it's a trend yet, but it's, it's, it's certainly a dip. So how, how do we protect this, this or control this research at, at the 6-1 level? And, and the, the answer is we don't. And that, uh, you know, if you think back to the 80s, and I'm one of the older people in the room that can remember the 80s, uh, the, the Soviet Union, the Eastern Bloc, you know, there's a lot of uh, concern with our technologies being, being siphoned off. So there's a National uh, Academy of Sciences study sponsored by the, by the DOD and the National Science Foundation, and that said, do we need to control this research? What, what should we do? And bottom line, uh, and I'll read kind of the quote from the finding, is the benefit of open and free exchange of scientific thought and fundamental research, 6.1 and 6.2, outweighs the risks that an adversary may benefit as well. And that President Reagan signed out what's called a National Security Directive 189, so you can Google that, it's a short document. That is national policy on basic research, and I'll just read the, the kind of the last sentence in it. No restriction may be placed upon the conduct or reporting of federally funded fundamental research that has not received national security classification. So that's national security policy. It'll, it'll be 33 years old in about two weeks, that policy. But after the 9-11 attacks, uh, uh, President Bush actually through Condoleezza Rice reaffirmed 189. Um, uh, Secretary John Young as ATNL reaffirmed it. Ash Carter uh, as SECDEF reaffirmed 189. So nationally, we've taken the position that controls on basic research, uh, uh, free and open exchange is much better than controlling the research. Uh, so just to, uh, uh, to, to uh, wrap up on, on some um, summary thoughts to kind of pull it all together, uh, science and technology is key to kind of maintain the economic and, and military superiority. I think we agree on that. Basic research, the numbers are not on our side. We've got a decreasing share of the global R&D uh, footprint. A decreasing number of international graduate students are, are coming uh, to the U.S. And then we have to see if that's a trend. A decreasing share of, of the number of bachelor degrees in engineering awarded. Uh, currently, China and India award over 50% of the bachelor's degrees in the world. The US, we're number fourth or fifth, and our share is decreasing. That's the pipeline for, our, for the, the future of, of our uh, in, in graduate school. Uh, talked about the world is getting smarter. Uh, should we add controls to basic research? That's, kind of the question here. I don't think so. I think we, we get far more benefit from having the best and brightest come to the US, study here, and then we need to keep them. We need to make them invent their technologies here, have them start companies, have them have the dream become richer than, than anyone ever thought. Um, I think we need to have a broader discussion on how the US university research enterprise can be leveraged by foreign adversaries. And just two examples I, I want to want to hit here. If you um, uh, look in the in the page, you, you can fi find this on Google too. But but everybody knows who Foxconn is. How many Foxconn? How many people have iPhones? Okay, that, that's who builds the the iPhone. Uh, so Foxconn just gave a, a gift of a hundred million dollars to a major research university to. Uh, set up uh, research programs in, in 
fundamental areas, but in the materials area, uh, computer security area, very broad areas. That's a huge risk. Uh, secondly, Ch the China's Thousand Talents Program. Uh, people have heard about that. Uh, the, the Thousand Talents Program, if you're not familiar with it, it was started in 2008. It'll be 10 years old. It's highly successful. This is where the Chinese will, will identify young, young researchers throughout the world, not only in the U.S. They will offer them a signing bonus, uh, typically around $100,000 to $200,000. They will offer them lab space in China, airfare back, back home. Those are risks. That's where we need to focus our energy on, on, the, uh, on gifts from international companies to universities and, and keeping our researchers uh, here. And that's uh, answer, happy to answer questions. Afterwards. Great. Thank you. Uh, well, Bob, you know, we always save the lawyers for last because they always have the answers. <laughs> and I know you won't disappoint us. Be prepared uh, to be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I have high expectations for you. Uh, Congress has passed the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act, known as FIRMA, which, as you know, is updating CFIUS. And I think that's an area that you're reasonably familiar with. And one of the questions that's been posed is that do you think this is going to be an effective way to deal with the problems that the three panelists before you have helped set out. So you could look at this panel and say one of these people is not like the others. Um, you've got three, three technically sophisticated and knowledgeable people, and then you have a lawyer. Um, what I can, what I can do is talk a little bit about the way in which lawyers can be helpful in this area, uh, which does not cover all of the problems we've talked about. Um, Harvey mentioned uh, CFIUS which of course has to do with foreign acquisitions of U.S. companies, and I think it's interesting that, so far as I can tell, none of the other three speakers mentioned that um, as an aspect of the problem, at least as, as it relates to this particular audience. Um, let me talk about um, what I see as a, a couple of different uh, aspects of the problem of protecting U.S. technology, um, which of course goes beyond the defense industrial base. It's a huge problem for consumer-oriented businesses as well. Um, but if you have a foreign competitor that wants to um, make a product that competes in the market with an American product or wants to acquire military technology that is as good as ours, there are a couple of ways that they can do it. One is they can invest a lot of their own resources in, re in research and development. Um, and as we've heard, uh, the Chinese are doing that. Um, there's really not much we can do about that. If a, company want, if a country wants to make those kinds of investments and actually do the work, um, more power to them. That's really outside of the scope of this. Um, the second thing they can try to do is they can try to buy it one way or another. Um, either by acquiring companies or by acquiring technology. Um, and this is where um, CFIUS and, and FIRMA come into play. Um, broadly speaking, CFIUS um, gives a com an interagency committee jurisdiction to review acquisitions of U.S. businesses by foreign companies if they present national security implications. And they have the ability either to impose uh, mitigation uh, uh, on, the, on the acquisition or to bar the acquisition altogether. Um, and there have been some fairly publicized examples of that, the most recent being um, Broadcom's attempt to acquire Qualcomm. Um, but, um, and, and the, the uh, Foreign Investment Reform, I, I forget what the acronym stands for, FIRMA, um, made some changes in CFIUS but most of those changes simply formalized what CFIUS was already doing. And in particular, they, ma they made clear that foreign acquisition of critical technology or critical infrastructures is an important component of a CFIUS review. Um, and also that the acquisition of large quantities of sensitive personal data um, is also a matter of national security. The Chinese uh, breach of OPM was a real wake-up call for the U.S. Uh, about the fact that, that for their national security purposes, one of the things that Chinese are doing is sweeping up as much personal data as they can, <coughs> mashing it against each other, and using that to try to identify intelligence agents or potential prospects for recruitment by their intelligence services. 
And so CFIUS is now directed to consider uh, whether acquisition of personal data um, presents a national security issue. There was a case um, a year or two ago where um, there was an, a, a Chinese effort to acquire a hotel company, which you wouldn't think uh, presented national security implications, except hotels have lots and lots of personal data about people. Um, and that w went before CFIUS and, and was a problematic acquisition. But the other way in which um, a foreign country can legitimately acquire uh, technology is not by buying the company, but through joint ventures or by imposing restrictions on foreign companies that want to do business in their, com uh, in their country. And we all know about the Chinese um, uh, approach of saying to people, you want to sell in our country, you have to share your intellectual property with us. And this problem was addressed by the other half of FIRMA, which essentially uh, directed the uh, Department of Commerce in an interagency process to uh, impose uh, restrictions on the export of critical technology and critical infrastructure. Um, this is something that is going to have to be fleshed out by regulation um, over the next months. Um, I, it's probably something that uh, all the companies in this room ought to be paying attention to because it may have a significant uh, impact on your business depending upon how they define the kinds of transactions that are subject to the export regulations and what kind of technology is subject to the export regulations. So those are sort of the above the line ways in which a foreign country can acquire U.S. technology. Uh, obviously, um, if they can't buy it, um, they can try to steal it. Um, and um, uh, this is, uh, they can do this either through uh, insider threats or through um, uh, cyber attacks. Um, and these are areas where the, the lawyers actually have a lesser role. Um, I don't think there is, I, don't, I certainly don't perceive that there is a general lack of awareness, certainly among people in this room, of the overall nature of the threat. Um, the fact that the, the, the Chinese and other countries are out to steal sensitive technologies from us uh, and the natures of the technologies that they're trying to steal, I think everybody probably has an intuitive understanding of that. Um, what is more important to keep up to speed on is the specific threat vectors that are being employed and the specific techniques that you can use to counter them. I, I, I totally second Leslie's statement that it is, it is a fool's errand to try to immunize your systems against attack. Um, it can't be done. The, the, the attackers have all the advantages over the defenders. What you need to do in this area is build your system so that, number one, you have the best possible chance of detecting when somebody in, intrudes into your system. And number two, you have the best possible chance of limiting the intrusion and limiting the damage don't interconnect everything unless there's a reason to do it. Um, uh, so you, you want to focus on notice and you want to focus on resiliency. Um, and um, uh, the, this is, you know, where lawyers can help here is helping you uh, keep up to speed on what the latest standards are, what the latest threats are, who you need to be in touch with in government to, uh, so that you've got a contact point if you have a problem. The most important thing in, on the cybersecurity side of things is don't wait to be attacked. Um, if the, you know, decisions that you make on the fly under pressure are a lot more likely to be wrong than decisions that you thought out in advance, prepared for, where you, you know who's going to be responsible for making decisions, who has to be notified. So, so training and planning is, is a key aspect of cybersecurity. The other point to make in this regard is that cybersecurity is a process, not an event. Um, it's, uh, you, you can set up your systems today, and in 12 months, they'll be outdated. And this is why you have to keep in touch with what's happening in the environment. Um, uh, and I guess uh, I'll stop there and let, uh, let Harvey uh, take it from here. Excellent. Uh, so, uh, you know, we say in this in DC, you're either a, a panda hugger or a dragon slayer. How do you approach China 
is sort of the divide. So we, as you know, in the near term had a number of indictments, Bob, of the five Chinese uh, out of Pittsburgh, the U.S. attorney um, filed them, uh, David Hickman. So I guess one question I have for you is, do you see that as a, an appropriate winner that we should be being, being more aggressive on the law enforcement side vis-a-vis uh, -vis when there are penetrations and we are able to have some form of attribution? What is the trade-off that the legal and intelligence community is making under, for, under those considerations when you were at the DNI? Well, I think that the fact that there have been, not only against the Chinese, but against Iranians and, and Russians, there have been several uh, cyber intrusion indictments uh, is indicative of the fact that the intelligence community, I think, is recognizing that it has to be a bit more forthcoming uh, and a bit more willing to tolerate risk um, in order to protect the country. Um, obviously, um, if you read, just to pick one example, um, the indictment that uh, Special Counsel Mueller brought against the Russian uh, internet trolls, there's a huge amount of detail in there which, is prob which probably provides some information to the Russian counterintelligence services. They, they probably learned from that. But um, I, you know, uh, one thing I'm confident of is that, is that Bob Mueller didn't return that indictment unless he got the, the okay from the intelligence community to go ahead and reveal that information. Uh, and this is something that is, I think, that the <coughs> intelligence community is, is getting a little more comfortable with, that if, if we keep everything secret, um, we're not going to accomplish anything. Um, there are people, I, I certainly have no uh, personal knowledge of the um, workings of the, of the leadership of the Chinese government, but there are people who will tell you that they believe that the indictment of the Chinese hackers played a role in the Chinese willingness to enter into an agreement that while they haven't honored 100%, has resulted in a lessening of the level of their cyber espionage uh, activities. So I think you're going to see going forward a, a greater willingness to uh, indict people in the situation where you can make an attribution. Mm -hmm. So one of the issues that the panel is focused on from different perspectives is trying to get our minds around how to manage supply chain risk management. That's a major issue. So I'd like to go down the panel and say um, ha what would be your recommendations? And I, I, Bob's recommendation is, which I strongly encourage, take your lawyer to lunch <laughs> so that the first time you meet your attorney is not during the crisis. How many of you know who your attorneys are who would handle uh, risk penetration? So I have about 20% hands went up versus 100%. But uh, why don't we start with you, sir? Okay. What would your sort of recommendations are for supply chain risk management? Well, I kind of touched on it earlier when I, I mentioned we were shifting from a compliance-only uh, approach to a threat-driven approach. And many aspects of this new methodology include <coughs> an understanding of the supply chain and under, include an understanding of the manufacturing process, the business process. So where we've gone initially with the, with the top tier technologies, we've gone to facilities that are manufacturing or coding, and we work with those technical SMEs. So we, we mentioned on the, um, earlier uh, having technical experts involved in the process, and that's very much the same for what we're doing right now with this new me methodology, DSS and transition. Another thing I would mention is um, if you have your smartphone, go to cdse.edu slash matrix, it's one of the tools that we make available. It's a 12 by 13. Uh, it's a very simple uh, way of looking at what Bob just mentioned also, is looking at the threat and how the threat approaches, the avenues of approach. So since 2009, we've categorized through our trends reporting from industry, these are the methods of operation that the adversary uses. So what we pursue with industry, when we show up, we use this as the central point of discussion to understand the methods and what you can do from an industry perspective to block or introduce a countermeasure to reduce your risk. So it's very useful, uh, we got good feedback on it, but it represents the totality of reporting related to specific technologies or sectors, and we could break it down specifically for a company and a facility. So that's one thing I would do, is, is understand that. Um, I'm ready to take other questions, but I'll let me pass it on at this stage. Okay. So you scooped my pointing to your diagram, although I didn't okay. have a printed copy of it. Again, you know, saying that 
security is everybody's job and everybody needs to be aware of it. This is excellent. I actually browsed through it and looked at quite a few of the cells. Um, you know, Raytheon has some initiatives going with supply chain where we're looking at this problem and working on ways to address it. Um, I'm quite certain that other companies in the defense industrial base are, are doing the same sorts of things. Um, it is a very scary world that we live in. Um, things that you never really worried about before you now have to worry about. So I think that awareness is certainly the first step. And like I said, from a technology perspective, as technologists, we have to worry about this. And in the past, these were things that we didn't really worry about, the details of you know, getting potentially counterfeit parts or, or parts that were defective, um, parts that had vulnerabilities introduced into them. Now we really need to be aware of that and really need to be looking at that and thinking about it and coming up with ways, you know, working with people like DSS and, you know, our supply chain management folks to counter those threats. If we have a two finger. If I do mind uh, adding on to what was just mentioned, um, one of the first things that we would offer is there's commercial due diligence tools that you can use and avail yourself to to understand your supply chain below. So if you're a tier, tier one or a tier two level, you can get a look using just commercial due diligence process and methodology to kind of understand your suppliers and where they reside and are they overseas, are they foreign controlled. Those are things that you could do on your own. And we've proven it out uh, probably 20 times. Uh, it's very, very important to have that information. And it's readily available. It's open source and it's, it's a proven methodology used for mergers and acquisitions. Alan, how do you see this? Yeah, so you usually don't think of academia and the supply chain in the same uh, sentence, but that's where it all starts. That's where the raw materials are for the innovations that, that's going to occur. And, and by national policy, it, it's, it's, it, it's open and, and, and unrestricted. So that puts you in a position where you really have to look at the pedigree of your information. Uh, there's been several examples where, where nations have spent a lot of money going down the, the, the wrong direction because of uh, you know, strategic level deception uh, programs. But uh, um, I, I think we just need to evaluate the pedigree. But basic research is where it all starts. So how do you deal with the issue of unclassified information that is yet critical inside the science base? Uh, we're trying to loop our minds around with the DIB, Defense Industrial Base, about information that doesn't seem to be critical by itself. But when you aggregate it, it has an extraordinary impact. In, reflecting what the enterprise's interests or focuses on. How do universities deal with that issue? Yeah, well, we're starting to. So, you know, we saw on the one side is we have the, um, uh, the National Policy 189, but on the other side we have the sensitive but unclassified, the CUI, which is a whole other discussion, and, and, and classification by, by compilation. We have to wrestle with it. But it, it's uh, right now the general thinking is that the 6-1 research by itself, not tied to an application, not tied to any applied research, is, is, is just that. It's basic research. I don't that, I'm not sure there's an easy answer to the question. Yeah. Uh, Bob, so one of the issues that the DIB gets involved with the lawyers is the DFARS, trying to actually operationalize those critical elements that DOD has said that the DIB has to follow. What kind of advice do you and your firm give about the DFARS vis-a-vis -vis to these firms about how appropriately they should be protecting that information and the tier one, tier two, tier three level of the supply chain? So I just want to actually go back on the, uh, not, not answer that question directly, but make a somewhat different point on, okay. on supply chain if I could, which is, um, one of the interesting developments over the last couple of years has been the government getting involved very, at a very, very direct and detailed level in monitoring the, monitoring the supply chain. Um, you see this in the action that was taken uh, by the executive branch to, to bar Kaspersky Labs, um, which is, is currently being litigated. You see that in the Defense Authorization Act, which had uh, language directed at Huawei and ZTE and some other com companies. And not only, I mean, everybody is aware that there was a provision in there that said that, that would bar the government 
from buying equipment from those companies. It's, it's not quite as widely known that there's also a provision that says that starting two years from now, the government can't contract with any entity that uses that, their equipment. So that if, if you're a government contractor and you have, it, it's not only Huawei and ZTE, it's a couple of other companies as well, and you've got their equipment or maybe people in your supply chain have their equipment, you've got to get that out of your system before the government will be able to contract with you. And, and I would anticipate that the government, that particularly in an era uh, and in an administration where uh, trade policy is and it viewed as an extremely important part of national security, um, you're going to continue to see specific directions like that affecting your your uh, supply chain capabilities. Great. Thank you. Uh, if I could just follow up those comments, uh, kind of reinforcing the message from uh, the legislative branch, which in the National Defense Authorization Act for 2018 included a provision, sec section 1696, which talks about providing supply chain threat information to industry related to 10 major defense acquisition programs. So it kind of reinforces the point that the legislative branch is very focused on this. In addition, Section 806 provides um, software providence kind of rule set for how we would work through a Kaspersky kind of situation in the future. So just to kind of add on, there are legislative things that we have to uh, respond to from the department's perspective. Great. So one question from the audience has been, we all agree that the security issue has to be shared by both geeks and wonks. But in the end, each organization is going to be placing one individual or one office accountable for the decision for the trade-offs. So the question that was posed was, in this trade-off between security and mission accomplishment, where should that responsibility lie for understanding the risk matrix, risk factors? So DOD, do you have any thoughts about it? or? At Raytheon, where should it lie in the corporate sector? Academically, who should be making the decisions in universities for acceptance of students and the risk involved of information? And then, Bob, who would you, in your advice, where would you recommend to a corporation where this risk analysis and final decisions should be made? I'll start off and uh, just say this is not a DOD position. This is certainly one that Defense Security Service is, uh, Service is pushing forward is the idea that uh, those that make the decisions on these trade-offs should be the ones that are um, using these capabilities in the future. Those that might suffer the losses on the battlefield should be given the opportunity to make some of those trade-offs. So they have to balance intelligence, acquisition, and security along that continuum. So we are of the mindset that that resides probably with the vice chiefs of the services that have the authority, Title X authority, train, man, and equip to make those choices, informed by acquisition trades, informed by intelligence and threat information, informed by security countermeasures. So again, not a DOD position, but certainly one that we're pushing forward and I think was well um, articulated in the Deliver Uncompromised study that was referenced earlier. As you're saying, this really raises the acquisition culture issues with the issues of the operators as for what they want. It's a really fascinating dynamic as where it should lie. Where do you see, how does Raytheon resolve this issue? Well, this is certainly something that, you know, I think there was a discussion about risk management versus being adverse to risk. So I think this mm -hmm. is something where, you know, industry really has to sharpen their pencils <laughs> on um, being very specific about what the potential impacts are, really look at, at things from a risk management perspective as opposed to just that's risky, avoid it. I would foresee, I've personally not been involved with any of these kind of trade-offs, but I would foresee that being as something that we work with our government partners that are, you know, the owners of these, these programs that we work on to make sure that they understand the aspects of the risk, uh, understand, you know, dependencies, potential cascade effects, and work with them to determine the path forward. I guess the other issue is there's potential liability attached to this decision-making process, which always, when you hear liability, you understand lawyers get extremely excited and interested. Um, but academically, where do you, what would you recommend either professionally or for a university to think through how to calculate income from foreign students versus the risk of the information going out the front door or through papers? 
I would say that, that most major research universities are also Department of Defense contractors that take contract research. So, so that puts them, in, you know, similar to Raytheon in that the FAR and the DFARs, we have to be fully compliant on that. I, I think it's the responsibility of those doing, especially the applied research, to make sure the, um, the leadership of the university, whether it's the president or, or, you know, or, or the chancellors, are educated on, on the risks. And I'll say at, at, at Penn State, we have uh, DSS in regularly uh, doing training for our leadership. Uh, in the town of State College, we have about a dozen, we have a, a dozen person FBI office that's in regularly to educate our leadership and, and we have to make the decisions as they come. Wow. So, so basically what I have to say here more or less echoes and combines what other people have said. Um, Harvey, who, by the way, is himself a lawyer. Let's not, let's not, let's not mistake that fact. Um, Why would I hide that? Yeah, um, but, but he made reference to liability, and I think that um, from, from, the, from the perspective of the company, the question is one, as Leslie said, of risk management. Um, what's the risk to the company going to be if things go south here? Um, ultimately, if it's serious enough, it's got to be the C-suite that is the people who are responsible for making these decisions. Uh, if it's a small enough matter, maybe it can be delegated down, but that decision should also be made by senior management to the company. There should be a sort of a, a process and an understanding within the company of who is responsible for making the decisions at what level of risk. Um, but ultimately, it's all going to come back to management because if a huge classified project gets compromised, management is going to be are going to be the people who are going to have to deal with that. It's hard to imagine, but the hour has almost flown by. Um, I'm going to break with protocol. Does anyone have a specific question for a specific panelist that they would like to take at this point? You've cowed the crowd. Oh, even. Have I see a hand going up here? Sure, I'll ask one. And you, but you might say who you are, shy and retiring. Uh, Aaron Gross McCaffrey, North of Drummond. So we talked about risk and the decision about who's making uh, the decisions related to an acquisition. That uh, might contradict with some of the uh, current acquisition strategies across all of our government customers. It's, it's going to be a process. I mean, it's not, we're not going to get there, you know, overnight. Certainly, we have a lot of policies, and that's what I think the, 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 the approach we're taking now with some of these recommendations and the deliver on compromise, what are the policies that need to be changed or updated, reviewed? Some of those are probably acquisition policies. So I think right now in the, the department, we're looking, what are the things that we could do in the very near term that set those conditions for the longer term implementation? I'm not sure I'm answering your question, Mayor Rose, but it, certain levels that we're focused on for those decisions uh, are at that level, but our work with the government contracting activities and with industry have to inform those decisions. That's what I would add at this point. Yeah, so I think going back to the deliver uncompromised, you know, having a, a fourth pillar of acquisitions, you know, we're all used to cost schedule and performance and there's some definite ways that those are measured. Um, you know, we, we develop software engineering development plans, we develop systems engineering management plans, we develop program management plans, all of these things associated with an acquisition. I think pulling this fourth pillar in, there's going to have to be kind of a, a rethinking of how those things that we're normally used to doing for, say, the old way of doing business, how those need to change to embrace this new method and, you know, what does success look like and how is the best way to communicate this and, you know, possibly even getting into, you know, where is the accountability and who ultimately has the decision authority for that. But I think there are a lot of changes that need to come through. Yeah. Um, and certainly for us, understanding, you know, evaluation criteria, you know, we always want to understand, well, how are we going to be judged? You know, we want to provide the best system, but we're sensitive to, you know, nobody has unlimited money, and so how do we make the best, you know, decision and the best system designed? that fit within the constraints. And I think all of that hopefully will come out of the work that you guys are doing on the fourth pillar. Alan, last word. 
your last word. Uh, I just, again, I'm, I'm going to go off script a little bit. And please take a look at this. This is the, the future of our nation. So that's my fifth homework assignment. Okay. In addition to the four others. The question is when. The question is when Bollywood makes a film of that. That's when we'll know we've arrived. It's, Pardon me. It's the 2018 Science and Engineering Indicators. Again, this is the summary. The real one's about uh, three inches thick. Go to NSF.gov. It's our tax dollars that paid for it. National Science Foundation. National so, Science Foundation. Bob, last word. No, nothing to add. Okay. Well, let me thank you. As I think you can see, I think this is the future for security as we try to lock down what we're doing because Innovation is the key to capitalism, and if whoever is able to have that lock on innovation is going to control the future market and market development. That's why we're so focused on this issue. Let me again end by thanking Noblis for the sponsor. I particularly like them for having focused on this issue. As you know, please join us in the exhibit hall outside uh, after this session for networking, and I believe the lunches will be out there. So I want to thank you, and I think the other thing is, please join me in thanking this extraordinary panel.